Chapter 22 of The Sleeper Awakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. Chapter 22 The Struggle in the Council House. As Asano and Graham hurried along to the ruins about the council house, they saw everywhere the excitement of the people rising. To your wards! To your wards! Everywhere men and women in blue were hurrying from unknown subterranean employments up the staircases of the middle path. At one place Graham saw an arsenal of the Revolutionary Committee besieged by a crowd of shouting men. At another, a couple of men in the hated yellow uniform of the labor police, pursued by a gathering crowd, fled precipitately along the swift way that went in the opposite direction. The cries of, To your wards! became at last a continuous shouting as they drew near the government quarter. Many of the shouts were unintelligible. Ostrog has betrayed us! One man bawled in a hoarse voice again and again, dinning that refrain into Graham's ear until it haunted him. This person stayed close beside Graham and Asano on the swift way, shouting to the people who swarmed on the lower platforms as he rushed past them. His cry about Ostrog alternated with some incomprehensible orders. Presently he went leaping down and disappeared. Graham's mind was filled with the din. His plans were vague and unformed. He had one picture of some commanding position from which he could address the multitudes, another of meeting Ostrog face to face. He was full of rage, of tense muscular excitement. His hands gripped, his lips were pressed together. The way to the council house across the ruins was impassable, but Asano met that difficulty and took Graham into the premises of the central post office. The post office was nominally at work, but the blue-clothed porters moved sluggishly, or had stopped to stare through the arches of their galleries at the shouting men who were going by outside. Every man to his ward! Every man to his ward! Here, by Asano's advice, Graham revealed his identity. They crossed to the council house by a cable cradle. Already in the brief interval since the capitulation of the councillors, a great change had been wrought in the appearance of the ruins. The spurting cascades of the ruptured seawater mains had been captured and tamed, and huge temporary pipes ran overhead along a flimsy-looking fabric of girders. The sky was laced with restored cables and wires that served the council house, and a mass of new fabric with cranes and other building machines going to and fro upon it, projected to the left of the white pile. The moving ways that ran across this area had been restored, albeit for once running under the open sky. These were the ways that Graham had seen from the little balcony in the hour of his awakening not nine days since, and the hall of his trance had been on the further side, where now shapeless piles of smashed and shattered masonry were heaped together. It was already high day and the sun was shining brightly. Out of their tall caverns of blue electric light came the swift ways crowded with multitudes of people, who poured off them and gathered ever denser over the wreckage and confusion of the ruins. The air was full of their shouting, and they were pressing and swaying towards the central building. For the most part that shouting mass consisted of shapeless swarms, but here and there Graham could see that a rude discipline struggled to establish itself, and every voice clamored for order in the chaos. To your wards! Every man to his ward! The cable carried them into a hall which Graham recognized as the antechamber to the hall of the Atlas, about the gallery of which he had walked days ago with Howard to show himself to the vanished council an hour from his awakening. Now the place was empty except for two cable attendants, these men seemed hugely astonished to recognize the sleeper in the man who swung down from the cross-seat. "'Where is Ostrog?' he demanded. "'I must see Ostrog forthwith. He has disobeyed me. I have come to take things out of his hands.' Without waiting for Asano, he went straight across the place, ascended the steps at the further end, and, pulling the curtain aside, found himself facing the perpetually laboring titan. The hall was empty. Its appearance had changed very greatly since his first sight of it. It had suffered serious injury in the violent struggle of the first outbreak. On the right-hand side of the great figure, the upper half of the wall had been torn away for nearly two hundred feet of its length, 
and a sheet of the same glassy film that had enclosed Graham at his awakening had been drawn across the gap. This deadened, but did not altogether exclude the roar of the people outside. "'Wards! Wards! Wards!' they seemed to be saying. Through it there were visible the beams and supports of metal scaffoldings that rose and fell according to the requirements of a great crowd of workmen. An idle building machine, with lank arms of red-painted metal, stretched gauntly across this green-tinted picture. On it were still a number of workmen staring at the crowd below. For a moment he stood regarding these things, and Asano overtook him. Ostrog, said Asano, will be in the small offices beyond there. The little man looked livid now, and his eyes searched Graham's face. They had scarcely advanced ten paces from the curtain before a little panel to the left of the atlas rolled up, and Ostrog, accompanied by Lincoln and followed by two black and yellow-clad negroes, appeared crossing the remote corner of the hall towards a second panel that was raised and open. "'Ostrog!' shouted Graham, and at the sound of his voice the little party turned astonished. Ostrog said something to Lincoln and advanced alone. Graham was the first to speak. His voice was loud and dictatorial. "'What is this I hear?' he asked. "'Are you bringing negroes here to keep the people down?' "'It is none too soon,' said Ostrog. "'They have been getting out of hand more and more since the revolt. I underestimated. "'Do you mean that these infernal negroes are on the way?' "'On the way. As it is, you have seen the people outside?' "'No wonder!' After what was said, you have taken too much on yourself, Ostrog. Ostrog said nothing, but drew nearer. These negroes must not come to London, said Graham. I am master, and they shall not come. Ostrog glanced at Lincoln, who at once came towards them, with his two attendants close behind him. Why not? asked Ostrog. White men must be mastered by white men. Besides... The Negroes are only an instrument. But that is not the question. I am the master. I mean to be the master, and I tell you these Negroes shall not come. The people. I believe in the people. Because you are an anachronism. You are a man out of the past, an accident. You are owner, perhaps, of the world, nominally, legally. But you are not master. You do not know enough to be master. He glanced at Lincoln again. I know now what you think. I can guess something of what you mean to do. Even now it is not too late to warn you. You dream of human equality, of some sort of socialistic order. You have all those worn-out dreams of the nineteenth century, fresh and vivid in your mind, and you would rule this age that you do not understand. Listen, said Graham. You can hear it, a sound like the sea, not voices, but a voice. Do you altogether understand? We taught them that, said Ostrog. Perhaps. But can you teach them to forget it? But enough of this. These negroes must not come. There was a pause, and Ostrog looked him in the eyes. They will, he said. I forbid it, said Graham. They have started. I will not have it. No, said Ostrog. Sorry as I am to follow the method of the council, for your own good you must not side with disorder. And now that you are here, it was kind of you to come here. Lincoln laid his hand on Graham's shoulder. Abruptly, Graham realized the enormity of his blunder in coming to the council house. He turned towards the curtains that separated the hall from the antechamber. The clutching hand of Asano intervened. In another moment Lincoln had grasped Graham's cloak. He turned and struck at Lincoln's face, and incontinently a negro had him by collar and arm. He wrenched himself away, his sleeve tore noisily, and he stumbled back to be tripped by the other attendant. Then he struck the ground heavily, and he was staring at the distant ceiling of the hall. He shouted, rolled over, struggling fiercely, clutched an attendant leg and threw him headlong and struggled to his feet. Lincoln appeared before him, went down heavily again with a blow under the point of the jaw, and lay still. Graham made two strides, stumbled, and then Ostrog's arm was round his neck, he was pulled over backward, fell heavily, and his arms were pinned to the ground. After a few violent efforts he ceased to struggle, and lay staring at Ostrog's heaving throat. "'You 
are a prisoner, panted Ostrog, exulting. You were rather a fool to come back. Graham turned his head about and perceived through the irregular green window in the walls of the hall the men who had been working the building cranes gesticulating excitedly to the people below them. They had seen. Ostrog followed his eyes and started. He shouted something to Lincoln, but Lincoln did not move. A bullet smashed among the mouldings above the atlas. The two sheets of transparent matter that had been stretched across this gap were rent. The edges of the torn aperture darkened, curved, ran rapidly towards the framework, and in a moment the council chambers stood open to the air. A chilly gust blew in by the gap, bringing with it a war of voices from the ruinous spaces without, an elvish babblement. Save the master! What are they doing to the master? The master is betrayed! And then he realized that Ostrog's attention was distracted, that Ostrog's grip had relaxed, and, wrenching his arms free, he struggled to his knees. In another moment he had thrust Ostrog back, and he was on one foot, his hand gripping Ostrog's throat, and Ostrog's hands clutching the silk about his neck. But now men were coming towards them from the dais, men whose intentions he misunderstood. He had a glimpse of someone running in the distance towards the curtains of the antechamber, and then Ostrog had slipped from him, and these newcomers were upon him. To his infinite astonishment they seized him, they obeyed the shouts of Ostrog. He was lugged a dozen yards before he realized that they were not friends, that they were dragging him towards the open panel. When he saw this he pulled back, he tried to fling himself down, he shouted for help with all his strength, and this time they were answering cries. The grip upon his neck relaxed, and behold, in the lower corner of the rent upon the wall first one and then a number of little black figures appeared, shouting and waving arms. They came leaping down from the gap into the light gallery that had led to the silent rooms. They ran along it. So near were they that Graham could see the weapons in their hands. Then Ostrog was shouting in his ear to the men who held him, and once more he was struggling with all his strength against their endeavors to thrust him towards the opening that yawned to receive him. They can't come down, panted Ostrog. They daren't fire. It's all right. We'll save him from them yet. For long minutes, as it seemed to Graham, that inglorious struggle continued. His clothes were rent in a dozen places. He was covered in dust. One hand had been trodden upon. He could hear the shouts of his supporters, and once he heard shots. He could feel his strength giving way, feel his efforts wild and aimless. But no help came, and surely, irresistibly, that black, yawning opening came nearer. The pressure upon him relaxed, and he struggled up. He saw Ostrog's grey head receding, and perceived that he was no longer held. He turned about and came full into a man in black. One of the green weapons cracked close to him. A drift of pungent smoke came into his face, and a steel blade flashed. The huge chamber span about him. He saw a man in pale blue stabbing one of the black and yellow attendants not three yards from his face. Then hands were upon him again. He was being pulled in two directions now. It seemed as though people were shouting to him. He wanted to understand and could not. Someone was clutching about his thighs. He was being hoisted in spite of his vigorous efforts. He understood suddenly. He ceased to struggle. He was lifted up on men's shoulders and carried away from that devouring panel. Ten thousand throats were cheering. He saw men in blue and black hurrying after the retreating Ostrogites and firing. Lifted up, he saw now the whole expanse of the hall beneath the atlas image, saw that he was being carried towards the raised platform in the center of the place. The far end of the hall was already full of people running towards him. They were looking at him and cheering. He became aware that a bodyguard surrounded him. Active men about him shouted vague orders. He saw close at hand the black-moustached man in yellow, who had been among those who had greeted him in the public theater, shouting directions. The hall was already densely packed with swaying people. The little metal gallery sagged with the shouting load. The curtains at the end had been torn away, and the antechamber was revealed, densely crowded. He could scarcely make the man near him hear for the tumult about them. "'Where has Ostrog gone?' he asked. The man he questioned pointed over the heads towards the lower panels about the hall on the side opposite the gap. They stood open, and armed men, blue clad with black sashes, were running through them and vanishing into the chambers and passages beyond. It seemed to Graham that a sound of firing drifted through the riot. 
He was carried in a staggering curve across the great hall towards an opening beneath the gap. He perceived men working with a sort of rude discipline to keep the crowd off him, to make a space clear about him. He passed out of the hall and saw a crude new wall rising blankly before him, topped by blue sky. He was swung down to his feet. Someone gripped his arm and guided him. He found the man in yellow close at hand. They were taking him up a narrow stairway of brick, and close at hand rose the great red painted masses, the cranes and levers, and the still engines of the big building machines. He was at the top of the steps. He was hurried across a narrow, railed footway, and suddenly with a vast shouting the amphitheater of ruins opened again before him. "'The master is with us! The master! The master!' The shout swept athwart the lake of faces like a wave, broke against the distant cliff of ruins, and came back in a welter of cries. "'The master is on our side!' Graham perceived that he was no longer encompassed by people, that he was standing upon a little temporary platform of white metal, part of a flimsy-seeming scaffolding that laced about the great mass of the council house. Over all the huge expanse of the ruins swayed and eddied the shouting people, and here and there the black banners of the revolutionary societies ducked and swayed and formed rare nuclei of organization in the chaos. Up the steep stairs of wall and scaffolding by which his rescuers had reached the opening in the atlas chamber clung a solid crowd, and little energetic black figures clinging to pillars and projections were strenuous to induce these congested masses to stir. Behind him, at a higher point on the scaffolding, a number of men struggled upwards with the flapping folds of a huge black standard. Through the yawning gap in the walls below him, he could look down upon the packed, attentive multitudes in the hall of the Atlas. The distant flying stages to the south came out bright and vivid, brought nearer as it seemed by an unusual translucency of the air. A solitary monoplane beat up from the central stage as if to meet the coming aeroplanes. "'What has become of Ostrog?' asked Graham, and even as he spoke he saw that all eyes were turned from him towards the crest of the council house building. He looked also in this direction of universal attention. For a moment he saw nothing but the jagged corner of a wall, hard and clear against the sky. Then in the shadow he perceived the interior of a room, and recognized with a start the green and white decorations of his former prison. And coming quickly across this opened room, and up to the very verge of the cliff of the ruins, came a little white-clad figure, followed by two other smaller-seeming figures, in black and yellow. He heard the man beside him exclaim, Ostrog, and turned to ask a question. But he never did, because of the startled exclamation of another of those who were with him, and a lank finger suddenly pointing. He looked, and behold, the monoplane that had been rising from the flying stage when last he had looked in that direction was driving towards them. The swift, steady flight was still novel enough to hold his attention. Nearer it came, growing rapidly larger and larger until it had swept over the furger edge of the ruins and into view of the dense multitudes below. It drooped across the space and rose and passed overhead, rising to clear the mass of the council house, a filmy translucent shape with the solitary aeronaut peering down through its ribs. It vanished beyond the skyline of the ruins. Graham transferred his attention to Ostrog. He was signaling with his hands, and his attendants were busy breaking down the wall beside him. In another moment the monoplane came into view again, a little thing far away, coming round in a wide curve and going slower. Then suddenly the man in yellow shouted, "'What are they doing? What are the people doing? Why is Ostrog left there? Why is he not captured? They will lift him. The monoplane will lift him. Ah!' The exclamation was echoed by a shout from the ruins. The rattling sound of the green weapons drifted across the intervening gulf to Graham, and looking down he saw a number of black and yellow uniforms running along one of the galleries that lay open to the air below the promontory upon which Ostrog stood. They fired as they ran at men unseen, and then emerged a number of pale blue figures in pursuit. These minute fighting figures had the oddest effect. They seemed, as they ran, like little model soldiers in a toy. This queer appearance of a house cut open gave that struggle amidst furniture and passages a quality of unreality. It was perhaps two hundred yards away from him, and very nearly fifty above the heads in the ruins below. The black and yellow men ran into an open archway and turned and fired a volley. 
one of the blue pursuers striding forward close to the edge, flung up his arms, staggered sideways, seemed to Graham's sense to hang over the edge for several seconds, and fell headlong down. Graham saw him strike a projecting corner, fly out head over heels, head over heels, and vanish behind the red arm of the building machine. And then a shadow came between Graham and the sun. He looked up, and the sky was clear, but he knew the little monoplane had passed. Ostrog had vanished, the man in yellow thrust before him, zealous and perspiring, pointing and blatant. "'They are grounding!' cried the man in yellow. "'They are grounding! Tell the people to fire at him! Tell them to fire at him!' Graham could not understand. He heard loud voices repeating these enigmatical orders. Suddenly he saw the prow of the monoplane come gliding over the edge of the ruins and stop with a jerk. In a moment Graham understood that the thing had grounded in order that Ostrog might escape by it. He saw a blue haze climbing out of the gulf, perceived that the people below him were now firing up at the projecting stem. A man beside him cheered hoarsely, and he saw that the blue rebels had gained the archway that had been contested by the men in black and yellow a moment before, and were running in a continual stream along the open passage. And suddenly the monoplane slipped over the edge of the council house and fell like a diving swallow. It dropped, tilting at an angle of forty-five degrees, so steeply that it seemed to Graham, it seemed perhaps to most of those below, that it could not possibly rise again. It fell so closely past him that he could see Ostrog clutching the guides of the seat with his gray hair streaming, see the white-faced aeronaut wrenching over the lever that turned the machine upward. He heard the apprehensive vague cry of innumerable men below. Graham clutched the railing before him and gasped. The second seemed an age. The lower vein of the monoplane passed within an ace of touching the people, who yelled and screamed and trampled one another below. And then it rose. For a moment it looked as if it could not possibly clear the opposite cliff, and then that it could not possibly clear the wind wheel that rotated beyond. And behold! It was clear and soaring, still heeling sideways, upward, upward into the wind-swept sky. The suspense of the moment gave place to a fury of exasperation as the swarming people realized that Ostrog had escaped them. With belated activity they renewed their fire, until the rattling wove into a roar, until the whole area became dim and blue, and the air pungent with the thin smoke of their weapons. Too late! The flying machine dwindled smaller and smaller, and curved about and swept gracefully downward to the flying stage from which it had so lately risen. Ostrog had escaped. For a while a confused babblement arose from the ruins, and then the universal attention came back to Graham, pursed high among the scaffolding. He saw the faces of the people turned towards him, heard their shouts at his rescue. From the throat of the ways came the song of the revolt, spreading like a breeze across that swaying sea of men. The little group of men about him shouted congratulations on his escape. The man in yellow was close to him, with a set face and shining eyes, and the song was rising louder and louder, tramp, 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 tramp. Slowly the realization came of the full meaning of these things to him, the perception of the swift change in his position. Ostrog, who had stood beside him whenever he had faced that shouting multitude before, was beyond there, the antagonist. There was no one to rule for him any longer. Even the people about him, the leaders and organizers of the multitude, looked to see what he would do, looked to him to act, awaited his orders. He was king indeed. His puppet reign was at an end. He was very intent to do the thing that was expected of him. His nerves and muscles were quivering, his mind was perhaps a little confused, but he felt neither fear nor anger. His hand that had been trodden upon throbbed and was hot. He was a little nervous about his bearing. He knew he was not afraid, but he was anxious not to seem afraid. In his former life he had often been more excited in playing games of skill. He was desirous of immediate action. He knew he must not think too much in detail of the huge complexity of the struggle about him, lest he should be paralyzed by the sense of its intricacy. Over there those square blue shapes, the flying stages, meant Ostrog. Against Ostrog, who was so clear and definite and decisive, he who was so vague and undecided, 
was fighting for the whole future of the world. End of chapter 22 This recording by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, July 2007